What up, EBR fam? Today I have brought you to the Spring Creek Park area in Fort Collins. Gorgeous, gorgeous day out. I mean, it's like 50 degrees. Uh, we, we've got snow everywhere because it snowed over the week. I was actually hoping to ride around on the, there's like a bike park right over there that I was gonna try and do some riding on for the review since we have an electric mountain bike here, um, but it's kind of muddy and snowy. We'll, we'll see, we'll go over and look at it in a bit here. But now a couple of disclosures for you guys before we dive into it. One is that Nairika did give me this bike in exchange for doing the review. Just wanna be upfront about that with you guys. It's been nice because I've been able to spend a little bit more time with it. I've got about 45 miles put on it now. Nice change of pace compared to a lot of bikes that I review where I only get to use them for you know one day and it limits my exposure to you know checking everything out in depth so that's pretty sweet uh second thing to just be transparent with you guys about is that I'm not an expert mountain biker, right? I, I love mountain biking, I think it's a lot of fun, but aside from some events that I've gone to, like outer bike and going with friends, I, I haven't done a ton of it, right? So I do my best to be informed and knowledgeable and share with you guys. And if you, So if you do really want to get the expert mountain biker's perspective on some of this stuff, then you might want to check out our forums, electricbikereview.com, where you can, you know, we've got a mountain biking sub forum, we've also got one for Nairika, so you can you know, chat with some more experienced riders about it. All right, now let's jump in. Nairika homie, that's what we're checking out today electric mountain bike from Nairika a little bit about the Nairika company if you're not familiar with them they they stand out to me as being you know they're one of many companies that do like Indiegogo funding Kickstarter funding for their bikes but they've done a good job with actually delivering products that are you know consistent with what they advertised and they've done this a few times the homie's one of their first ones they've got a new one out now um well not really new anymore but they've got the Nairika Prime which is the big fat tire bike version now they've got the NYX that I think kind of just came out that's a more premium end electric mountain bike right here this one's a little bit closer to the affordable end of things you'd be looking at two thousand dollars USD for the base price on the homie Nairika does offer different sizes for their bikes, uh, well for the homie anyways, uh, small, medium, and large. This one is the large frame. Uh, it, it's still a little small, I mean for me, right? I'm, I'm super tall, six foot three. So even if I raise that seat post all the way up, I'm not getting full leg extensions. And then I was, you know, leaned really far forward on this uh, since the stem is, is so short. So you, you can get different sizes to fit you well. Large frame here, um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what to recommend as far as your rider size and what you would want. I think it really kind of depends on what type of riding you're going to be doing. I like having it a bit more small and nimble when I do any off-roading because it's, uh, it's easier to maneuver. Now, this is an upgraded one you're looking at here. They threw in some upgrades for me. I'm gonna run through those upgrades just real quick and we'll, we'll talk about them, each of the components more in depth as we go through the bike. But the upgrades that you see on here, We've got the magnesium air fork, bumps it up to 120 millimeters of travel. We have got an upgraded motor here, 500 watt rear hub motor from Bafong instead of the standard, which is 250 watts. We've got an upgraded drivetrain here, the Shimano Dior drive system here. This is a nine speed, really awesome. I think it performs super well. Uh, that, that's another one of the upgrades here. We've also got the carbon fiber package. Now this bike is a carbon fiber frame, even at the base model here. I love the, the style of it. It's definitely got a unique look, helps it stand out. The carbon fiber package adds the seat post and the handlebar and I think maybe even the yeah even the the stem they were telling me is a carbon fiber as well helps to shave off some more weight that actually helps bring the weight on it down to 47.1 pounds as you see it here now there's some stuff that adds a bit more weight right like i've got the lights on here there's a kickstand on the other side that, that those are some of the other upgrades on here this headlight uh, which i do actually quite like a lot and the the tail light here it's got a smart tail light comfort saddle you know also a little bit more weight compared to the sport saddle what else and the kickstand you can see it right down there so as you see it here this would cost you two thousand eight hundred and forty three dollars bit more than the standard of two thousand dollars usd whether those upgrades are worth it or not really are going to depend on what you want to use the bike for and that's one of the main things I want to talk about today is they've got a ton of options when you're picking out one of these bikes on their website. They've done a great job on the website to make the ordering process really streamlined and clear so that you can pick for each category which upgrades you would like to get. And they can, uh, you, you can really kit this out to serve a variety of uses. If you wanted to be more mountain biking 
strictly and you know no riding around town or anything like that i would probably skip the 500 watt motor stick with a 250 watt because that's going to impact what trails you can get access to if you've got a 500 watt motor back here there's a lot of trails that cap it at 250 watts uh, another thing that might limit your access to trails is the throttle so uh, we've got the thumb throttle on the left grip here it can be great for getting around town or if you're really tired on your way home but mountain bike trails, a lot of them will say, you know, no throttles. That can be another restriction that you'd have to keep in mind. I probably would also go for the sport saddle instead of this comfort one if I was going to be mountain biking. Shaves off some weight. Uh, this one, I mean, it's a uh, pretty decent saddle, pretty comfy. It is kind of a bummer that you don't get a dropper seat post here, as that can be really useful for mountain biking, but that is not available as an option, although you might be able to add one for it yourself. Having this unique frame design does have its drawbacks because it's... Uh, well, you know, you don't have a seat post tube for one thing. I mean, I noticed that uh, when I was riding through mud and stuff like that, the suspension got extra dirty. Normally you have that seat post tube right here that helps to kind of block some of that from your rear frame suspension. Not so on this one here. So, you know, make sure you keep it nice and clean. I cleaned it up before the review, but you know, just riding over here, it picked up all this dirt and dust. So, you know, that's gonna happen. That's, you know, gonna happen regardless of your frame or which mountain bike you have. If you don't have fenders, you're gonna get mud everywhere, especially when you are riding on trails. I do like the suspension upgrade here, these magnesium air forks, they do great. Both of the suspension for the front and the rear, I think, pretty solid. I mean, they're not, uh, you know, nothing, nothing super fancy here. I mean, you can only adjust the rebound on both of them. 90 millimeters of travel for the rear, 120 up front. You can adjust the pressure, of course. They've got the, the Schrader valve on there and you can screw off the cap right here to get to the one on the front fork. So you can get those dialed in. You know, they're not top of the line, but this is, like I said, this is going for more towards the affordable end of things to still get a really well, you know, high performing product if you're looking to get into electric mountain biking. Okay, so before we dive into more, these components a bit more in depth, a little bit more about Nyrica. If you buy from them, they're online only for your ordering. So you know, you gotta get it shipped to, you gotta assemble the bike. This one took a little bit more to assemble than most bikes that I've gotten delivered to me. Not by any extreme amount. I mean, you gotta put a bike together, you gotta put a bike together. So still quite a bit of work, um, but the, the handlebar was, you know, completely removed and the, you know, the display, uh, the controls for the display and the throttle and stuff, none of that stuff was attached. So I had to, you know, get those attached on there, mount on the stem, get everything tightened up. The front wheel was removed, of course, that's pretty common. So it, you know, it took me maybe a half an hour longer than with other bikes that I've done. I did not come with a toolkit for it, which some do, but you know, it's not a big deal. It's mostly just some Allen wrenches and you probably have those laying around. I, I certainly do. Uh, one thing that I did have trouble with when I got it set up, uh, I was getting this error code on the display, error code 008, and it turned out it was because of this motor cable right here. So it, it comes out of the bottom of the frame right near the bottom bracket. Uh, here, I'm gonna lay the bike over so we can show this a little bit easier. Stand by. Okay, you can kind of see it a bit better here. Uh, what was going on was that this this bottom, this cable right here, the motor cable coming out of the bottom of the frame, it was a little bit too tight. And so when the frame suspension would compress in the rear, this would swing up, it would pull on this cable, and then it was uh, pulling this connector loose right here. So, you know, it's it was super easy to fix once I figured out that's what it was, and Nyrica support, you know, I sent them told them what was going on and they immediately told me like, oh, it's this cable, you need to adjust it. So, you know, I just pulled out some slack and that's why we have some slack here right now. It has been fine since then. I did notice while I was down here, the, the edges of this, the hole right here in the, in the bottom of the frame are a bit sharp. Uh, it's, it's not really something you can see on camera, but there, there's this little cut in the edge of the cable right here. It was actually cutting into that shielding and it doesn't seem to be happening up there. I mean, I can see a little bit. And so that's, I think, a, kind of an area of concern. I would definitely, you know, put like some electrical tape or something uh, around the shielding there just to give it a little bit extra. And maybe that's something that Arika can improve on their earlier ones if this is just a little bit smoother. I mean, you could also just file that edge down. Make sure it's not gonna damage the cable. So anyways, took me about an hour and a half to get everything set up and going. Um, one thing that was, I don't, it wasn't really frustrating, I guess, but something that I noticed is that, like, I had to mount the, the display and the control pad for it and the throttle and everything, and the the cables just ended up being kind of a mess, right? Now, to be fair, you know, I, I'm the one that set this up, and I'm more of a, a, a function over form kind of guy, so I don't really care what it looks like as long as it works well, but 
it is just kind of sloppy, right? Like there's there's a lot of extra cable for the d control pad right here for the that connects to the display. So I have it, you know, wrapped around here to eat up some slack, but it didn't eat it up perfectly. And maybe if I like, put the display on the side instead of in the center, I could have alleviated that, but then I would have had to use some, there's like some rubber liners that can go in between the clamps for the display. Since right here at the center, you've got a clamp diameter of 31.8 millimeters, but out here it's really quite thin. So you'd have to use some extra shielding, which they did provide, but it just ended up kind of being a pain. And so I was like, I'll just put it right in the center. It's good, easy to see anyways. So then you've got you know, all these these cables going on here. The cable for the throttles got uh, a little bit extra than you need, really. And it just, yeah, th there wasn't really a perfect solution for it. And this came loose on me. It's supposed to, you know, kind of like, well, let's turn the handles this way so it'll actually slide back in there. Do, do, do. So that's how that's supposed to look, which helps it to look, you know, a bit cleaner and nice, but it doesn't stay in there very well. So as soon as you turn the handlebars to the left, then it pops out. You could, uh, you know, maybe if you like bent these metal parts out to get a little bit more resistance, you could glue it in there, but you don't really want to do that in case your bike needs some work in the future. You don't want your, <laughs> your cables glued. So, so like I said, it's, I mean, maybe I'm just spoiled from riding a lot of bikes that are, you know, come like per fully assembled ready to rock and roll like the gazelle we looked at last week when you do the assembly yourself and you have the option of do i want a trigger throttle or not you know which display do i want do i want the light as an as the owner you have to kind of figure out where to put those on here yourself and so you could probably spend a little bit more time on it make it pretty if you wanted to but it was not worth it for me now i was able to get everything assembled rocking and rolling it's it's great the derailleur has been shifting perfectly right out of the box the brakes have done great so yeah, you know, it's like any other bike that you order online. You gotta set it up. If you're lucky, you might have a bike shop in town that can help you with the setup. But you know, you might wanna check that out first if you don't have the tools or the knowledge to do it yourself. Another thing you would probably do without if you were gonna use this strictly for mountain biking was lose the kickstand back here. Most mountain bikes don't even come with a kickstand uh, or pedals actually, because you can, you know, put on your clip-ons or whichever pedals you want. Uh, but a kickstand is just extra weight and it can you know, kind of get in the way, get damaged if you fall over. The one on here is a little bit frustrating actually, because it's, uh, if you look at it from the side, we've got this nice low Q factor in the center here at the bottom bracket. And so when you're pedaling, if you've got you know, big feet like mine, size 11 men's, it's really easy for your heel to hit the back of the kickstand here. I lift this up, uh, let me move this around right here. So yeah, you can see <laughs> my foot is like right up against that kickstand uh, by, by a pretty wide margin, honestly. Like I, I think of it because I have big feet, but it, it, pretty much anybody's gonna be hitting that. I find my heel catching on the kickstand quite a bit. And if I'm wearing loose shoes, it'll actually pull my shoe halfway off. Uh, so the kickstand is actually kind of frustrating regardless of mountain biking or not. And, but I think that's just a consequence of the way that this unique frame is designed and having that low Q factor up front. So, you know, just something to be aware of. I've gotten to the point where when I'm riding, I just keep my left foot with my heel angled out just a little bit to the side so it doesn't catch there. Minor annoyance, something to be aware of. Now, if you weren't gonna be using this just for mountain biking, maybe you wanna do just like a little bit of off-roading trail, adventure riding, if you will, then, uh, you know, the, the Comfort Saddle, pretty nice upgrade. I would also get their uh, upgraded adjustable stem. They've got a stem that it's got a little bit more of a rise and adjustability to it. You can lift those handlebars up. The way it is right now, it's a really forward-leaning, aggressive style. So it's, I mean, you know, it's a mountain bike, right? So forward aggressive seating position, great for any kind of off-road rough riding. But if you're trying to, you know, get around town, if you're just, you needed to run to the store or commuting somewhere, not a great fit. It's not not nearly as comfortable. This really, it's kind of in a weird spot, right? You could get those other accessories, more powerful motor and the throttle and everything for using around town, but you know you don't have any fenders, you don't have a rear rack, so you can't carry luggage with you. You do get the bottle cage up here for for carrying a water bottle, and you could switch swap that out and mount something on the bosses if you want to. Keep in mind, it's kind of a just from their frame, it's it's just like a weird design. It's uh, you know, it's certainly not a circular shape in here, so it might be hard to mount some other accessories on there if you've got something you wanted to mount. Uh, but anyways, it's uh, 
So, so like I said, it, it kind of just depends on what you want to use it for. And it, it feels almost overwhelming when you're buying one of these bikes because it's, uh, it's just a ton, of, a ton of stuff, ton of options to choose from. It's like, well, what do I need this for? What do I need that for? So let's go through the components in detail here. And we'll talk about some of the options that you have for those different ones and how I like the ones that we've got on here. Now let's start out with the brakes uh, while we're up here. Shimano hydraulic disc brakes. These are, I mean, these things are awesome. They perform great. You've got the huge 203 millimeter brake rotors. This is an upgrade from the standard, which are 180 millimeter, but they're, they're just fantastic. They've got the, you know, the Shimano ice freeze technology to help them stay cool. D the nice uh, two finger levers up here. Hydraulics great because it has really fast response, really easy to actuate. My only gripe with the brakes is that we do not have motor inhibitors. So if you look at the, the levers right here, I mean, these are good levers, adjustable reach and everything. No motor inhibitors. What motor inhibitors do on an electric bike is as soon as you squeeze that brake lever, even a little bit, cuts power to the motor. That way you're not fighting the motor if something goes wrong or if you like, you know, forget and you have the throttle on or something like that. The place that it's annoying on this bike is that it's a derailleur system and to shift your derailleur, you, you've got to be pedaling the bike. And so if you're coming up to a stop sign and you're slowing down, but you want to downshift so you're not in some high gear, then as soon as you start cycling those pedals, the motor activates. So you have to squeeze on the brakes. You got to like fight the motor while you're slowing down. It's just not, not an ideal setup, right? And I've kind of worked around it by just, I, like I keep it on level one assist that is pretty low power. So it's very easy to overpower the motor. But I, I think that's a really big opportunity for improvement. Add some motor inhibitors onto these brakes, make the shifting part easier. We've only got a 500 watt motor back here. So it, it's not like it's that big of a deal to fight it. It's pretty easy to overpower with this level of hydraulic brake just something to be aware of uh, moving back up front here check out the tires here we've got the schwalbe rocket rons on the front and the rear these have that same addix e compound that schwalbe has been putting in a lot of their e-bike specific tires so nice solid tires here they've got puncture protection evo evolution and they are tubeless ready that's this like tle snakeskin tubeless easy is i think uh, what it stands for there so good, solid performance from the, I mean, I like them. They're great. They've got nice, good traction, good volume of air without, uh, without, you know, they're not plus size or anything. We're just working with standard hub spacing here. So I like it because it makes it feel a little bit more, more nimble, more lightweight, right? 47 pounds for the whole bike is really a pretty solid setup for an e-bike. Most e-bikes, you know, you're looking at 50 to 55 pounds at least and on up for some of the bigger ones. So thanks to that carbon fiber and everything down to 47, you could probably get that down to I don't know, at least 45 by stripping out some of the accessories. You have the same exact tire on the front and the rear. So there's no specialization that you will see on some mountain bikes where the front one is designed more to help with steering and the rear one is more to help with that traction at the rear wheel since that is where your driving power is coming from. Uh, moving on back here, we'll, we'll look at this suspension here. As I mentioned, magnesium air fork, 120 millimeters of travel. I think they're uh, like, 20, 27, 28 millimeter stanchions on there. It looks just beautiful, really, really nice. And it, I mean, it does a great job. It, it does what suspension is supposed to do. You can adjust your rebound there. So it is a little bit more basic in terms of adjustments than some premium forks out there, but I think it gets the job done. Really nice fit and complements well with this rear suspension from X-Fusion. I will mention that the front, I believe, is an X-Fusion product as well. They've got it branded as Nyreka, but I believe it's X-Fusion under the hood, if you will. So back here is the X-Fusion uh, D2 Pro R. This is uh, more, you know, this is towards the the basic end of the line of the options from X-Fusion. So similar to up front, you can adjust the rebound and that's just about it. You're looking at 90 millimeters of travel and it's... Uh, that's the, like, the, the amount that the, the rear wheel itself can travel as that frame contracts. Now you can get this with a torque sensor, but for my bike here, I've just got the cadence sensor, right? So, you know, cadence sensors measure how fast you're, you're, you're cranking, you're cycling the cranks, right? As your feet are going around on the pedals, that's what activates the motor versus a torque sensor that measures how much pressure you're actually putting onto the cranks. Now, I think a torque sensor is a much better fit for a mountain bike because it'll respond. If you're going up a tough hill, you're really putting some effort into it. It'll help you out more. 
And then if you're just cycling lightly, it won't help you at all, which would actually, you know, alleviate that issue I was talking about with the motor inhibitors and shifting. Anyways, uh, so the, the entire, like, bot, this is a Buffong bottom bracket here that has the speed and cadence sensor inside of it. So it's fairly basic, you know, you've just got the, the square uh, tapered spindle on there. It's not ISIS blind or anything like that, but it does get the job done. It's, I've heard some knocking coming from the bottom bracket here as I'm pedaling that only started happening in the last uh, five miles or so. I've, I've heard that on tons of bikes and I, I don't think that it's something to be concerned about, but it can just be a side effect of you know, the bottom bracket being not quite as premium, but still works good. We've got these awesome race, uh, dream race work cranks here, 170 millimeter standard length, aluminum alloy pedals here, pretty lightweight. And uh, I mean, you know, they're solid. They get the job done. It'd be easy to swap those out for clip-ins if you prefer to ride with those. Oh, let's see here. Uh, before we turn the bike around to look at stuff on the other side, we'll just talk about the seat post and saddle here. It's a carbon fiber seat post, right? So nice and lightweight, lightweight really helps to, you know, every little bit counts, right? Uh, a couple gripes with it. One is that the, the tube that it's going into here is too tight for it. You can see these all these scratches on it and it's, I mean, it's real scratched up because I've been adjusting it, right? And I mean, you might need to adjust it depending on what type of riding you're doing. That's why they put a dropper seat post on a lot of mountain bikes so you can adjust that on the fly. It does have the quick release down here, but even when you've got this thing all loosened up, it's still just a little bit too tight for it up there. And it also does not appear to have any kind of a maximum height marker on it. So I don't know if that means that you can set it as high as you want and it'll be fine, or they just forgot to put that on there. Um, you know, you don't, you certainly don't want to break it, especially since you've got that nice carbon fiber seat post. So I've had it, you know, all the way up to where it's right at the, the bottom of that tube here. And it seems to be fine. Uh, but you know, just, uh, just something to note on there. This tightened back in. All right, got us moved around here. We can check out the drivetrain here. This is the Shimano Dior setup, and it is a, a quite a nice setup. I do like it a lot. This is the Shimano Dior long cage derailleur. It's got the clutch. Nine speeds back here. You're looking at 11 to, I think it's 11 to 38 teeth on the back there. Not, real nice wide range combined with the 38 tooth steel chain ring up front from Decus. This is a narrow wide chain ring that helps it to grip the chain better. So there's less chance that it's going to fall off. We don't have any kind of a, you know, bash guard, derailleur, chain guard going on on here, which is fine. This is a mountain bike, so I wouldn't expect to see it there. The narrow ride teeth will help to keep things from falling off, and I haven't had any issues with that. So really solid job there. There's that motor in the rear wheel, 500 watts from Bafang, I think it peaks at around 750, 6.3 pounds for the weight on that and 48 Newton meters of torque. It feels a little underwhelming riding it on throttle just cause I've been, I mean, I've been riding all these crazy bikes from Juiced and stuff that are like, you know, 750 to a thousand Watts and over that, like on the Hyper Scorpion. So compared to those, it's, it's not gonna be some like satisfying zooming around town on the throttle. But I, I, you don't want that on a mountain bike, right? That's actually, the more powerful it is, the more it's gonna limit your access to trails and off-road riding. And it's, you know, a bike like this, to me, is a little bit more about, you know, getting some exercise, having some fun, and having a little help from the motor, if you need it. Uh, one more thing to note on, on the frame here is that when you turn all the way to the side, you know, that suspension can bonk into the frame, like so. So there's a, it's, it's kind of like a little bump guard on here, under here. This is just like a plastic and foam padding thing that adhesives right on there. Uh, it's a little crooked. And they, they send you an extra one of these, I guess, if this one falls off. Uh, is this enough protection for, you know, the frame of the suspension? I hope so. I kind of worry that it's going to, you know, pop these caps loose or something, but it's been holding up fine so far. So you know, just something to be aware of. Uh, now the battery, battery is in the down tube right here. As you can see, it's getting nice and dirty. <laughs> um, if you need to, you can like press this little button right here and the LEDs light up to show the charge. You're probably not gonna be able to see that with the lighting the way it is, uh, but it does work. You can see it with normal eyeballs. Here's the cap if you wanted to charge the battery while it's on the bike. Put that back on there. Let me grab the keys out here. I think they did a really nice job with the battery integration. Just the look of it, right? Very sleek, very stealth look. All right, so got the keys here. Doo -doo -doo. So you just gotta turn it to the side like that. That means it's unlocked. Now it, it, it 
We kind of moved out just a tiny bit here, but it's stuck in there pretty good. Now this is not a two-step removal process, right? So over time, as things kind of loosen up with wear and everything, it's, it's possible that you could turn the key and that could actually just fall right out. Uh, hasn't happened to me yet, but you know, it is pretty new. So you gotta, it is a little annoying. You gotta kind of get your fingernails under here to, you know, get the battery to come out. There we go. So it is stuck in there pretty well. And here you go. 5.5 pounds for this battery, 374.4 watt hours. That is 36 volt by 10.4 amp hour. So, um, you know, that's pretty decent capacity. I mean, it's it's not a lot by a long stretch. I think around 500, four or 500 watts is becoming the more like standard medium ground. So this is a little bit low, but on a bike like this, I think it's a good fit. You want, you want the lightweight as much as anything. So you can, of course, charge it while it's off the bike. We'll pop that open again. There's your charge port. Now this little button right here can turn the battery off. Very hard to see because there's not much difference between off and on. So right now it's off, it's raised a little bit. When you press it, it sticks down. Uh, that means it's turned on. That can be a little gotcha there if your bike doesn't turn on for any reason. Then to, uh, well, before I put it back in here, let's, uh, let me lay the bike over again. So here is a look uh, down uh, inside uh, the battery compartment area in there. There's where it connects right there in the back. And I wanted to show you this uh, because it, if you wanted to take the battery off the bike to save some weight, maybe when you're riding on a trail, I wouldn't recommend doing that just because you're going to get so much mud and everything all up in there and all over those battery terminals. You could come up with some kind of a cover for it. I mean, maybe even just like some tape that you can peel off. But you wouldn't want to just ride it like that because you're going to get dirt and all kinds of stuff in there. So now we can get this back in here. And when they're mounted on the underside here, it can sometimes be a little bit of a problem just because of space issues. But since we've got the nice big suspension up there, it should be pretty good. See if I can do it with one hand. Uh, click. Yep. So when you when you get it in there, it does snap in real nice. It, it, it's a very satisfying feeling. It helps you give you confidence that it is in fact locked in. Not going to come flying out of there on you. Uh, I do got the charger. Uh, where did I put it? Here it is. This is the upgraded charger. So. Like many other parts on the bike, it's been upgraded for a little bit extra cost. Four amp charger here, you know, quick charger is what they call that. Still pretty lightweight at 1.4 pounds. It's got a little uh, little fan in there that kicks on when it's charging and, you know, does the job easy enough to throw in a backpack and carry with you. Okay, so we're gonna run through the, the display and controls here. Grayscale LCD. Um, it, it doesn't have a whole lot of like readouts or anything like that and it's it's not removable Which is kind of a bummer on a mountain bike uh, because these can get banged up and damaged You know if you run into trees and branches or you crash which is going to happen at some point uh, This could get pretty banged up and damaged uh, Yeah, but you know you kind of need it on there if you want to use the motor while you're riding so you know You might have to just take your chances um, It's uh, they're pretty durable. So oh, yeah, hopefully that won't be an issue um, I've got the dis the control pad mounted right over here on the left. You could move that around to whichever side you want. I've got it kind of far in, but I have you know I have big hands, so it's not too bad of a reach for me. And it's you know if you move it over here further, you kind of start bumping up against that uh, the brake lever there. So eh, I mean, like I said, I don't I don't use the the electronics a ton when I'm riding. I like to ride it on a low level of assist or even turned off because you know, I like to get some exercise while I'm going here. If you're changing your assist levels up and down a lot, I could see that getting pretty annoying. So you probably want to move that out there just a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and fire up the display here. Just hold down that power button and it will turn on. A really nice feature of these displays is that they're very, very easy to see under any lighting condition. I mean, we're in like bright direct sunlight here. Super awesome. If you're riding at night, it's got a backlight that you turn on by holding down the plus button here. And I think it does show a little... Uh, no, it does not. So it does not show a lights icon to tell you that the backlight is on. Uh, I don't... Yeah, it's it is on. It's 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 going to be really hard to see because it's such a bright day out here. So you do have that option there. And as I mentioned, it's a pretty basic display. So you got your battery thing up here, battery meter, four bars is it. 
25% steps. Not real precise, so you can get some range anxiety from setups like this. You'll see the battery percentage fluctuate based on how much load you're putting on the motor. So, you know, it's... Eh, it's more of a, just a minor annoyance than anything else. This is a nice lightweight bike. It's got a great drivetrain. If you run out of battery, you can bike yourself home. You'll be fine. Uh, you've got your assist level on the left right there. It starts off in one, no matter what you leave it at before. And then you can hit the plus right here. Take that up all the way to five or all the way back down to off. And when you're in off, the throttle is completely deactivated. So you don't have to worry anything about that. Now, when you are in assist level one, that will cap the maximum support of the throttle at around like 11, 12 miles an hour if we lean up on the kickstand so the rear wheel is not touching the ground and then just hold down the throttle, you'll see it you know, hits it right about 12. So yeah, every assist level has a new limit for the speed that you can get on the throttle. So if we were to bump this all the way up to assist level five and then hit the throttle, then we are at uh, 26, so it looks like it's balanced out at about 26.8 miles per hour there. Uh, which is uh, kind of an interesting speed. It's not quite up to, you know, 28 miles per hour, which is normally associated with speed pedal X, but you shouldn't be reaching that on throttle anyway, right? The, the way that it works for most bikes that are following the class one, two, and three system is that your throttle should only be taking you up to 20 miles per hour for a class two, right? And then you could have pedal assist up to 28 for, you know, the class three speed pedelec. So like many bikes that you can order online, the homie and presumably the rest of the ones from Nyrica are just they're in that kind of a gray area where they you know they've got the throttle and they've got pedal assist and they can go quite a bit faster than 20 miles per hour and regulations vary from city to city so do some checking into regulations in your area and especially trails if you're going to be riding on those because uh, this is a lot of power to be taking on a mountain biking trail more than you would probably need go ahead and bump that back on down to level one I ride in level one most of the time so it gives me some help starting out, but not, you know, not an overpowering amount of help. And then when I'm slowing down and downshifting, it's not annoying to, you know, I don't have to fight the motor uh, when I'm downshifting nearly as much. And we got some more readouts on here to talk about. We got the time right down here on the bottom, which I actually don't see on a lot of displays. It's kind of nice to have a clock. The trip timer right here, as you can see, I put 45.7 miles on here. You can get into the settings by holding down plus and minus. And you can change a few things in here. You could switch over to metric instead of imperial. Press the power button to cycle through these. You can set your top speed, which is set at 28, even though we can't quite get to it. Uh, this is the backlight power, I believe, at eight. So I've got that cranked all the way up. You can change the time, and that's it. So as mentioned, pretty basic display, not a whole lot you can adjust or tweak or monitor on there. I think it's fine. I'm more interested in riding the bike than having all these fancy electronics on there. But it is a lot more limited than something you might get from, say, Bosch, when you get like the, the Kiox or the Nyon or their smartphone hub and all that fancy stuff. So a little bit more limited here. Nyrica does have an upgraded color display. I can't speak to the functions on that one, but I'm sure that it's got quite a bit more to work with if that's something you're interested in. The throttle over here is variable, so if you press down on it more, you'll get a little bit more juice for it. Uh, let's see, what else? Let's talk about the lights uh, while we're up here. So these are, you know, after third-party lights, if you will, provided by Narika that they sell in their store. And I actually really quite like the lights here. So this, uh, so yeah, you, you pull that tab down and you can slide the light off to the front. This is a nice bright light. Like it's, it's got a whole bunch of different modes for your different brightness and flashing and stuff. Uh, it does not have bright side cutouts, but uh, yeah, see it <laughs> quite bright there. Let me try and shade this. So there's these little orange side cutouts on the side that they do light up a little bit, uh, not a lot. So you don't, you don't get a whole lot of side visibility safety from it, but you know, every little bit helps. The big win on these, I think, is that they're USB rechargeable. So you can pull down this little uh, flap here plug that into a micro USB and charge it up. Much better than having to swap out batteries. It seems like it's got a pretty decent life on it. Uh, I, I do, like I said, I like, I really do like this light. It just slides back on there. It's, uh, it's nice that it's removable, because if you are just running to the store or something like that, you can slide it off, take it with you, and it's also quite easy using the quick release on here. You could switch that to another, uh, like the other side of the handlebar. You could move it between bikes. 
So, so I, I do like that light a lot. That's, that's a pretty solid light. And back here, the smart tail light. Uh, this is kind of permanently-ish mounted on here. Um, the, the main part of it anyways, you can see we've got like these zip ties on here, but you can unscrew it. Whoop, dropped it. And this one's USB rechargeable as well. It's a smart tail light, and I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it seems to be able to detect motion versus standing still and switch to like, you know, so when you start slowing down, it, it gets a little bit brighter and starts flashing. I haven't really been able to monitor how well it works since I can't see back there while I'm writing, but uh, I don't know, that's a pretty cool idea. And I think that overall it does a great job of just helping you have some extra visibility writing at night. It's nice and bright. And similar to the front, I like that it is rechargeable like that, and I probably would just leave this one on here most of the time since uh, it, it doesn't look removable. I doubt people would guess that you can just screw it off. So pretty cool to have those. Uh, let's see, what else are we going to talk about up here? I know that we talked about the drivetrain a little bit. We can look at the shifters for the cockpit end of things here. Shimano Dior, this is one of the, I mean, this is a great setup from Shimano. These Dior trigger shifters are really fun to use. Nice, clicky, tactile feedback. The Dior has two-way on the top one right up here, which means you can pull it back like this, or you can push it forward with your thumb. So that's a pretty sweet setup if you are, let's say you're riding with your fingers on the brakes, right? Like you're going downhill, so you want to keep a finger on the brake lever there. Keep from getting going too fast. You can still operate both shifters with your thumb. Some people just prefer to do that. Some like to pull uh, with the index finger. Nice to be able to have that option on there. Okay, uh, let's see here. We'll get this fired up. Starting out, I'm just gonna click that to off for the assist level. I'm just ride it around like an acoustic bike it's getting started out here all right let's do it i've got the the saddle lowered down so that i can sit a little bit more upright it just makes it easier you know working the camera and everything uh but you can see you know even even with it set lower that i've got kind of a, a forward lean here on my my seating position so if you raise that saddle up you're going to be leaning even more forward you know as i mentioned you could get the adjustable stem if you wanted a little bit more comfort there. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, let's just get going. Oh, see, I should have shifted down before we got here. Doo, doo, doo. Uh, if you shift it all the way down to first, like I have it now, uh, it's, I mean, it's awesome. It's, you, you'll be able to tackle hills without even needing the motor power with this. Very, very easy, very efficient. I wanna see if I can show you guys that knocking I was hearing in the, coming from the bottom bracket here. Uh, so that knocking's only been going for, I mean, it started within like the last five miles here. Um, so I'm not super worried about it. I've heard similar things from many bikes. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, so we're, we're, we're doing some cruising on, uh, it's kind of like a dirt gravelly type trail. <laughs> it is very, very messy. Uh, this was the park I wanted to ride around in a bit, but I think there's a little bit too much snow to be doing that. So. Uh, so still riding unassisted out here and quite easy to ride on the grass and suspension does a nice job you know balances it out this is some pretty rough and bumpy grass out here but yeah, still feels pretty comfy you know we're getting up around eight or nine ten miles an hour here so it does it does off-road very nicely the traction feels good there is quite a bit of vibration coming through to the handlebars here. So I may need to just tweak that suspension a little bit uh, to help it. You know, this, this is more of like a, a washboard kind of a riding surface though. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the, oh yeah. <laughs> so just from, you know, that short little ride on the trail and in the grass, I mean, it's, we got water and mud everywhere. Uh, super, super wet and dirty. I got, got a bunch. I can like feel it soaking through my butt, and my bag's got a bunch on it too. So, uh, like like I mentioned, we 
we didn't even go all that fast through that stuff there. So not having any fenders, if there's any, you know, rain, mud, bad weather, this is not gonna be a fun time for getting around town without getting super messy. So, hey, you know, it is a mountain bike, probably not what you wanna be using it for, but I just wanted to show you what that looks like. We even have some water and mud flying up there. No. Uh, let's give the throttle a go, shall we? Throttle and pedal assist, kind of check that out. Bump this on up all the way to five, and then, uh, yeah, let's just take off on the throttle. There's 20. So the acceleration really slows down once you start gaining speed. And you'll know, keep in mind we're on full battery right here. And it looks like we're topping out at, uh, you know, 23, 24 miles an hour. Now as the battery level declines, you're gonna find your acceleration and the top speed you can reach on the throttle go down a bit as well. That's that affects every e-bike that's not unique to Nyrica. So it's certainly not a speed demon on the throttle. I think it's fine. It's a bike to me is more about, you know, this bike's about getting exercise. Kind of having some fun with it. So let's, uh, let's do a little pedal assist. You know, we've got it in five right here. This is a fairly quiet motor, so it's kind of hard to hear, but it does kick in quite quickly. Like by the first time the first revolution is completed, slow down a little bit here. Now there's a delay. Uh, so, you, so you'll notice after I stop pedaling, there's a bit of a delay. The motor keeps going for you know, like another second or so. Uh, which is just consequence of having that cadence sensor instead of a torque sensor. So you have to stop cycling the cranks in order for it to notice. Uh, just something to be aware of. It's not as responsive as a torque sensing setup would be, but still does a good job. Uh, something to note if you're a, a tall rider like me is that uh, the cranks are pretty low to the ground and so it's uh, it's easy to get some heel strikes on the on the ground if you're uh, let's say you've got uh, the, the balls of your feet on the cranks I can just put my heel down and scrape right there it's just something to be aware of you know you don't want to go over like a log or something with your your crank down you'd want to get them up to be a bit more level right there uh here's that uh what i was talking about with like hitting the kickstand you can see my my heel gets so i have to kind of like ride with my heel out because if i turn it in then it bonk it hits that right there and you know it kind of tries to pull my shoe off so i honestly want to just remove the kickstand because I don't really need it. You, know, you can lay the bike over <laughs> or whatever, lean it on a wall. Uh, okay. So when we're when we're in pedal uh, pedal assist level five, it's uh, it's it's fairly peppy. You know, it gives you quite a bit of oomph, so that if you are pedaling, like you can really get some speed going quick. We'll shift up on that Dior system there. Yeah. So we're we're already up here at twenty. There's 24, 25. So right about here, the motor stops helping out. So you're just on human power. And it is a really well-built well -built bike as far as that goes. It's very easy to ride at high speeds. So check it out if we shift this back down to a zero. Ooh, watch out for that guy. And that guy. <laughs> uh, so I've got it in pedal assist level zero here. But uh, I mean, I'm still, like I'm accelerating still. I'm even going on a little bit of an uphill here. You know, keeping it right around 22 miles an hour. So the drivetrain's awesome is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. I think that it complements the motor setup well. And honestly, like if I was buying this bike, specifically for you know my my how i want to configure it i'd probably go with the uh, 250 watt motor i think it'll be fine to complement the drivetrain access to more trails and stuff lighter weight 
Um, it is pretty stable, riding no-handed. You can see we've got a little bit of a, a wobble going on here. Uh, it's, I, I can't really tell if it's like frame flex or just is something with like the geometry of it, but uh, it does it does feel quite stable. And actually I've been riding it like this quite a bit just because it gets uncomfortable to be, you know, leaning forward all the time. And I've, I've been wanting to, you know, test this out so I could do an informed review. And so I've been, you know, riding it to the gym and riding it to get a few groceries and stuff like that. So I do like how wide the handlebars are. You can get a nice wide riding stance on it. Feels good and you have really long arms like I do. Okay guys, got you mounted on the frame here. Uh, sorry, I know it's kind of a funky angle uh, just from the, the way the seat post is set up here, but uh, there's that D2 Pro R suspension from X-Fusion. You should be able to get a decent view of that and the cassette from Dior back there. So I'm gonna be shifting up and down the gears, jumping some curbs, doing a little trail, you know, just right in the kind of over some rough terrain here so you can see all of that in action. And first off, I'm going to take off on just the throttle. So you can, you know, get a sense for how loud the motor is when you're a little bit closer to it there. as hub motors go, pretty solid. down you can hear what I meant about having to kind of fight the motor. So I'll start slowing down and then I want to downshift. You can hear the motor starting to kick in because of that cadence sensing pedal assist. Ooh. Nice and muddy now. Ooh. Not the best riding conditions, but hey, we made it. Oh yeah, look at that. All, all nice and muddy, it's everywhere. Everywhere on me too, I'm sure. I wish you could see my camera, it got splattered too. All right, I uh, found us this uh, pretty, pretty steep hill here. We're gonna do a couple climbing tests here on the throttle end with pedal assist, see how it does. For the hill test, uh, I've got you on the chest mount here, lower the saddle a little bit. Um, I'm lowering this down so that uh, you guys can see forward a little bit instead of just looking straight down. Okay. Uh, so first what we're gonna do, bump this all the way up to level five on the assist. Then we're just gonna try this hill on the throttle and see what, see what we can do with that 48 Newton meters of torque. And we're off. So far, so good. It's a slow acceleration, but we are still accelerating about uh, 12 miles an hour now. Okay, now we're now we're losing speed. We are dropping. We're down to eight. Oh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> down to five. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't think we're quite gonna make it. Uh, uh, see, I mean, it's not not a very long hill, but it is fairly steep right at that part here. Um, so. That's, I mean, that's really just, that's a consequence of having a hub motor. There it is in the rear wheel here, uh, versus having a mid-drive, right? So a mid-drive motor, uh, if, we, if we had a mid-drive, it would be able to use the drivetrain, right? Because it moves the cranks, or, and so it would be able to take advantage of shifting down into first gear, getting that mechanical advantage. But since we are using the hub motor, we don't get that, right? So not as good of a hill climber, as you would get on a mid-drive experience. But 
As I said earlier, I think that that's okay on this bike because we have got the awesome Shimano DR drivetrain. So we're gonna tackle that hill again. Woohoo! We are going to tackle that hill again, but this time I'm going to pedal and help out. So get shifted down here. So I'm all the way down in first. I've got a really rapid pedal cadence here. Shift it up a little bit. Yeah, we're, we're flying up the hill now. I'm really not putting a whole lot of effort into it either. We're up in, I think, gear three. No problem at all. So as long as you don't mind doing some pedaling, getting some exercise, it's gonna do fine climbing any hills that you wanna throw at it. We're gonna bomb back down that, cause that was a, that's a pretty fun spot. Little brake test. Oh yeah, yeah, we broke 30 miles an hour there and super short stopping distance, awesome performance from these Shimano brakes. They do a great job. Uh, so I've got it turned off now and, you know, even with the saddle really low, I mean, look at this speed that we're getting up here without any electric assist. Pushing on by 20. I really do love riding this bike with the motor shut completely off. It, it feels really smooth and comfy. Suspension does a great job. It feels good at, uh, at high speed like this. There's 25. And as you can hear, I'm, I'm not out of breath. You know, I'm putting in some exercise here, but this is far from my limit. Oh yeah. So you know you had a, a fun ride. Uh, so w one use case uh, for this bike I wanted to call out that's maybe a little bit niche, but uh, it might apply to you, is if you like to mountain bike, but you live you know kind of a long ways away from the trails and you, you like to just ride it normally without using an electric power, but you gotta get there, right? Maybe you're like me, you don't own a car. A bike like this could be a pretty nice fit because you can use the, you know, use the motor while you're getting to the trail and back from it and then just shut it off while you're riding it. It's heavier than a normal mountain bike, but not by that much. It still feels pretty lightweight and nimble. So you know, if, if that's you, that could actually be a really nice fit for having this kind of in-between setup. Okay, guys, that is it for today. Now, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, chime in in the comments section. You can also catch us back on electricbikereview.com. We've got the forum there where you can connect with other riders, including a Nyrica brand forum. We've got the full written review for this bike, all of the measurements, all of the specs, all of the options. So check that out if you've got any questions on the details of it. Okay, guys, thanks for checking in. Ride safe out there, and I'll see you next time.